purchase price was 270. I think we put 80 into it and then it appraised for 450. So basically at the end of the day, after you pay out your existing debts and whatever you paid to renovate the property, you end up with a, a property that has an infinite return because you really don't have anything left into that property. So it just gives you the, the ability to, to recycle money. Welcome to the House Hacking Success Podcast, where you'll learn the path to free rent and financial freedom through real estate. Featuring your hosts, Brad Labrie and Drew Klingler. What's up, everybody? It's your host, Bradley Labrie, and today I want to talk about the podcast sponsor, Rentometer. Whether you already have an established rental business or analyzing your first rental deal, you know that getting the rent right is crucial to lowering investment risk and optimizing your rental income. That's why the go-to source for rent data is Rentometer. Property investors and property managers rely on Rentometer because it is the fastest and easiest way to access quality rent data for addresses and neighborhoods anywhere in the United States. You can also research current, local comps, trends, and property data. Don't take our word for it. Rentometer analyzes over 500,000 rents per month and gets rave reviews from customers. My property manager, myself, and my clients all use Rentometer anytime we are looking to purchase a new property to know exactly what we can get for our properties. Go to Rentometer.com today to get your seven-day free trial and save up to 60%. Grow your rental business smarter with Rentometer. What's up, everybody? Real quick before we start the show. If you go down to the description or the show notes for this podcast episode, there's a link and that's going to send you to a page that you can download our free ebook on. This ebook is really good. Brad wrote it and it covers everything that you need to know about house hacking in a very structured order so you can put all the pieces together. All right, enjoy the show. Welcome to House Hacking Success. Today we have a special guest, Mark Canton, who is a professional hockey player. Mark, we appreciate you coming on. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, pleasure to be here. So we've had uh, quite a few guests, and uh, we have yet to have a professional hockey player. So be before we begin with your real estate career, now you have 13 doors, a lot of burrs, a lot of interesting things we're going to learn from your real estate career. Let's talk a little bit about kind of playing in professional hockey, what that was like. Yeah, so, so I grew up in a, a small town um, northeast of Toronto. And for anyone that's kind of unfamiliar with Canadian culture, a lot of it's based around hockey. That's kind of what most people gravitate towards uh, when they're young. So I played hockey for basically all throughout the years when I was young. And then the way it, it, it works here in Canada, typically, unless you go to take a scholarship and go stateside, is you, you play junior hockey. You basically move away from home when you're 16, play four years of junior or five years, and then move on to pro uh, after that. You know, sorry, my hockey career gave me some great opportunities, um, you know, playing in a bunch of different places, but it also really it set the foundation for my real estate uh, career kind of post hockey as well. So I guess I just give you a quick summary. So I played junior hockey, like I mentioned, played in, in a couple different teams in, in Ontario. And then fortunate enough, I signed a contract with the, the Boston Bruins for three years. And then I played in their system for a year, got traded to the New York Islanders, who I played with for a couple years. And then I played for the Anaheim Ducks organization and then played a year overseas. So that kind of sets the, I guess, the quick summary of my uh, my professional career. Yeah, for sure. It sounds like some highs and lows getting traded and stuff. What was that like going between organizations? <laughs> Quite the experience. I think my first time I ever was traded, it was actually, I was talking to my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, but we were talking, it was, there's a trade deadline day. I don't know the exact day it fell on, but it was somewhere, one maybe the first week of February. And uh, at that time I was with the uh, Boston Bruins and I had no inkling that I was even on the consideration for any trades, but I was, I was literally watching, you know, TSN. And I remember at that time, Chels called me, it was, the deadlines actually set it at specific time. So mm -hmm. Chels called me. She heard a little bit about, I never even talked to her about it. She heard a little bit about this deadline thing. So she called me kind of inquire a little bit. And I was like, oh yeah, it's like, you know, it's whatever it's coming up in like a half hour. It's, you know, it's fine, whatever. And then maybe like a minute after the deadline, I, I got a text from a buddy of mine back home and he's like, what, what just happened? And then I was, he called me. And then as, as I was on the phone with him, the GM of the Bruins called me and basically told me the news. And then as soon as I, that, that call ended i looked at my phone and yeah everyone found out from the the tsn ticker at the bottom like they knew before i did so <laughs> looking back on it it's funny now but at the time yeah talk about uh your your world kind of getting turned upside down within a matter of you know a minute so what what is it like kind of the transition going between teams because you went to the islanders after that correct yeah yeah exactly the thing about hockey culture is you know a, a team is essentially a family and it's there's like everyone knows kind of everyone so it's not so much 
that, that intimidating to go on a new team because you know you'll get along with everyone and it's, there's always someone that best buddies with someone that you just got traded from like it's very small you know it's more having to it was just myself I was I was I was living on my own at that time so it's basically relocating having to go pack up all your things and then having to be somewhere at a certain time and trying to figure out you know what to do with your existing lease and yeah it definitely an overwhelming situation but you know it's just one of those things that it, it happens professional sports is a business so it, it happens yeah and you keep touching on the culture of, of sort of hockey and things of that. And we hear that, you know, I hear that a lot from athletes growing up in that kind of culture. Mine was football, but there is a culture of that. How much of the culture of, of sports and hockey do you think translated now to your investing career? Oh, absolutely. You know, it's always, you know, the team's only as successful as uh, as the tightness of the group. And, you know, it's it, it translates very well into real estate. It's not an individual sport. It's definitely a team sport. It might be only you, you know, if you're not doing joint ventures or, or syndications, it might be only you buying the buildings. But, you know, to successfully, um, you know, purchase, renovate, lease out, manage, like there's a lot of players that are, are part of that team, you know, and it's something that in my investing career now, now, you know, my wife and I, that's something we we emphasize on a lot. The relationships that we have with everyone that, that helps us with our business. Like we, we absolutely, um, you know, treasure those relationships, whether it's, you know, our, our cleaning team that turns over units or any of the trades that I use or, you know, an agent that helps me out or it, it could be anything. But it's like we really, really value those relationships and we put those at the front of, of, of everything we do. You know, I know Christmas is coming up, so we'll we'll make an effort to um, even if it's sending like a thank you card for everything they've done for us in the past year or in the past, we've done gift certificates for them to take their significant other out or, or whatever it is, just some way to to thank them for what they do for us. Yeah, for sure. And just so many traits transfer, you know, like de delayed gratification in our sports industry. I mean, you you practice year round, you know, prepare for hockey season uh, for only, you know, is, is it 82 games in, in the minor leagues as well? Basically, we would play probably three games a week, whether that's, you know, a mid game week and a Saturday, Sunday, or sometimes we play like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But you hit it right on the head. It's, you know, we practice for so long. And then when it comes down to it, you're actually practicing for, you know, the 18 minutes you play on the ice, you know, a yeah. game. So that, you know, that that's that's really when you look at it from, a, you know, outside perspective is, is you're, you're you're putting a lot of time in to perfect that craft, really, yeah. which is the same with real estate. It's really the same with any career. There's so much work that goes on in the back end that, you know, and that's the one thing kind of that you know, kind of bugs me a bit was when you see people on social media and you see like these all these material things and blah, 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 blah. And I think you can, you can look at that 15 second clip and, and you can throw around like, oh, they must be so lucky. They must be so this, that. And really like there's nine out of 10 times, there's so much that had that, that individual had to endure and able to get to where they were. Yeah, for sure. That's something that I hadn't really thought of much, but you, you know, we are sort of conditioned in as athletes. We, we put in so much time that it's almost just become second nature to us. Put in that much time for the end result of, like you said, 18 minutes on the ice. So it does kind of buy bug us a little bit when people try to take shortcuts because we understand that there are no shortcuts in sports no no not at all like you can't yeah you, you certainly you can't fake it like that's anyone that you know i've ever played with whether it was when i was eight years old or whether when i was you know 28 years old in my in my last the year before i decided to step away from the game but you know my work ethic is is what me what got me to where I, I was you know any of the minor hockey teams that i talked to around the area here i i was never the best player on the ice by any means um you know talk about probably maybe i was always a good skater but never one of the best players and um you know it was just my uh my tenacity and my willingness to just outwork and to yeah to be honest that's kind of the only way i that I know how to do stuff. And the one thing about work ethic is that's something that you have complete control over. You know, it doesn't matter any other variables or what anyone else kind of puts in your way. Like you have complete control about the, over the, you know, your, your, your commitment and your uh, just desire to get better. And yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of the only way that I know how to do stuff. And, and that seems to translate it really well into the real estate as well. Yeah, for sure. So let's talk a little bit about, you talked before the show about uh, every off season, you would have a couple of months where you'd go home and you, and you would set a goal for yourself to buy a property. Let's talk about that first one, kind of, uh, you know, what drew you to real estate and what that first deal was like. So I will we'll give a little backstory. So it is a, it's a little bit of a long story, I guess, but so how I even got introduced to real estate, like this was never, my parents were involved with it. My grandparents had a condo in Ottawa, but it wasn't, you know, it was, it was something they bought and then they had the same tenants in it for, for years and years. 
years. So I never really even thought about it as, you know, them actively being investors. But it was actually when I was uh, 16 years old and I moved away from home. So I moved in the way it works is you, you, you move in with a billet family, kind of a, kind of a weird concept. You've never heard of it, but you <laughs> essentially move in with another family and then they put you, you know, you get a room and they put you up in their house and they kind of become like your second family. So I, I moved in with this family. So the, they were both at that time getting started in real estate. So he's a fast forward to now. He's actually one of my best buddies. This was the, uh, like the billet father, I guess. He's one of my best buddies now. He's actually he was in my wedding party, but he kind of, we started talking about it a little bit here and there. And then as I, you know, when I was like 17, 18, he gave me rich dad, poor dad to read. And I it, honestly, it was never even, never even really crossed my mind until I started reading this. And then we talk and he'd always talked about how to get basically a free house, you know, fast forward to now, like that's called the Burr strategy now, which mm -hmm. everyone refers to it as. But at that time it was just like, okay, how do I get a free house? Yeah. And so, yeah, so we, he basically, we would just talk and talk and talk. And then finally, when I had uh, like, you're not making any money playing junior hockey in Canada, you know, you're, you get whatever it ended up being like 50 bucks a week, basically. Like you're not in it for money. It's basically for where that will get you. And then when I signed my, my first NHL contract. That's I, I kind of used yeah the money that I made there. And I, I knew that this was the path I was going to take. I've already done a lot of research and everything up to that. My eyes were wide open and I knew I was going to get into real estate investing. And so the first property I bought was, it was a single family home. It was a, a, a bungalow. It had five bedrooms. And I kind of, at some point, you kind of just need to jump in. Like, you know, you can do as much research as you want, but you can get to a point where you're, you, you develop paralysis by over analysis. So, you know, I tell everyone now, like you just got to kind of jump in and then you'll deal with stuff as they come up. So that's what happened with this property. I, I, I rented it as a student rental. And yeah, as soon as I started seeing the, um, the cash coming in at the end of the, at the, you know, at the first of the month, it was, yeah, it's hard to kind of forget about that first experience. And that kind of what gave me the motivation to move forward with this. Yeah. So, uh, how were you able to finance that first deal? So that's actually, it wasn't, so I, I know there's buying your first home. I think in the, in the States, it's called an F, FHA loan. Am I right? Correct. Yep. So there's a first time home buyers in Canada as well. My situation was a little bit complicated because I mm -hmm. was a, I was living in the States. So I was actually a U.S. resident. Yeah. So I had to, I had to put down a significant down payment here. So I had to put down, I believe 24. 5% is what I had to put down here just because on, on paper, because I was living in the States, it just made, it, yeah. it wasn't that, it wasn't that clean looking with the bank. Right. Right. So I, I put down a significant down payment on that property. Um, but that being said, like the, the model itself isn't any different, whether it, at the end of the day, like, you know, your podcast is about ha house hacking, but if something gets you into a property and it makes sense, I mean, yeah. I a hundred percent, if I wasn't living in the States and if I wasn't pursuing hockey, I would have done the same thing, but I would have lived in in that property and rent to do the other bedroom. Yeah, now we get, we get this question a lot from our Canadian listeners about, you know, is there a FHA version in Canada? Talk about the first time home buyer, like obviously not in your situation, but what is the uh, traditional first time home buyer loan look like in Canada? That's a great question. And I, I'll tell you what I think I know. I just, I've never done it here. So, but just talking with other, uh, like, like buddies of mine and, and coworkers, um, like you can, you can get away with putting uh 5% down. Obviously they'll look at your, you know, debt to income ratio and stuff, but you can put 5% down and then um, pay into, there's a CMHA insurance. So your, your, your interest rate goes up a little bit to pay into that, but yeah, you can, you can get away with putting 5% down. Awesome. Awesome. So fast forward a little bit, you, you have several units. What did it look like kind of coming back to buy that second property? So the second property was a, it's actually the, it's actually the duplex that, uh, my wife and I uh, live in now. Awesome. Um, so it was a, a lot of the inventory where I live, they're all like century homes, mm -hmm. um, which I do. I love century homes. I mean, there's, we've, we've had our battles. If you're renovating one, you can, you can, you know, that there's a love hate relationship there, but you know, you can't deny the, the, the beauty that's associated with these, but it's a century home duplex. So at that time I bought it, it was already rented. And then I think I bought that maybe in like August before I went back to hockey. I think the tenants changed over. The cash was good as it was fully occupied and the cash flow was still solid. So yeah, I bought that just with intent to, to hold it long term. And then I saw the one unit, it's neat and it had a ton of potential at the time. So that's the unit that I, one summer I came back, basically renovated it, it all. And uh, that's what we live in now. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, did you sort of, you talked about not really growing up in a real estate family. Did you teach yourself pretty much everything as far as these renovations or did you hire most of them out when you were playing. 
No, so my yeah, so my my father was always a very handy guy. I like guess he still is now. I'm consider myself a, like a very yeah, a very hands on person. You know, if if hockey wasn't the path I would have taken, uh, like I, I'm a firefighter now. But if hockey wasn't the path when I was taking, I probably would have gravitated towards firefighting as well. But I would have definitely gone into the trades. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't just because of kind of the the logistics of a hockey season. Like you, you couldn't you couldn't pursue a trade and play hockey at the same time. It wouldn't work. So, you know, a lot of the stuff I did have, my mechanical knowledge is good, but I just didn't have that much experience. So, yeah. So I, I basically learned by doing. I mean, there's a ton of info now more than ever. There's a ton of info on you, anything you want to learn. You can learn on YouTube, whether that goes yeah. from, you know, if you want to fix your own car and you know nothing about cars, like someone has taken the time to make a 10 minute video on your specific model of car and year showing you how to change, change out the specific part you need. Like it's, it's pretty incredible. Like I, yeah. I, 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 I I don't know where, you know, all these people have the time to do it, but like it's our ability to access information is incredible right now. So there is a, definitely a surplus of info out there. A lot of this stuff, yeah, I, I learned by by doing and from my mentor, so the my billet dad in Belleville, we worked on a couple projects together and he works as a contractor. So, you know, it came down to, to, to framing or um, laying floor, or hanging, you know, kitchens, like all this was was learned. So the first, yeah, few projects, I, I, I did it all. Um, it's, and I recommend that, people do get their hands dirty because it certainly gives you an appreciation a for you know the trades and it gives you knowledge about you know home construction what's realistic timelines and then just like the cost right mm-hmm. of, of what things cost and how long they actually take to do mm-hmm. I, I don't think like now we don't do nearly as much um, if there's some stuff that I, I enjoy doing I'll do it but uh, at the same time you know time is money and, and money loves speed so we, we try to hire everything out now for sure for sure so speaking of speed you you guys sort of specialize in the burr uh, method which like as you mentioned earlier was never really a thing until the past few years which is just buy renovate rent refinance and repeat is the is the acronym talk a little bit about the deals you've done that way and the process what that actually looks like and when it comes down to refinancing what's up everybody let's take a quick minute and talk about rent ready are you new to house hacking and wondering how you find tenants and collect rent especially while trying to maintain professional boundaries in a shared living space rent ready can help you manage your house hack setup for less than nine dollars a month you can do it all fill rooms quickly with sites like facebook marketplace and craigslist with a free professionally designed listing page. Find high quality tenants with TransUnion certified background checks, electronically send, signed, and store leases, and collect rent for the entire lease or set up month to month charges. For your tenants, they use RentReady's app to complete the application, sign their lease, and pay you rent. They can even submit maintenance requests from the app instead of knocking on your door. Even better, Rent Ready is unlimited, so you don't have to pay per unit or per tenant. Just one flat price, which puts more money in your pocket. And speaking of putting more money in your pocket, Rent Ready has given our listeners a discount to get 50% off any Rent Ready plan when you sign up using our special code SUCCESS at RentReady.com. That's R-E-N-T-R-E-D-I.com using code SUCCESS for 50% off any Rent Ready plan. All right, let's get back to the episode. What that actually looks like when it comes down to refinancing. Yeah, like you said, I mean, the word's certainly been thrown around a lot in the past. Before that, it was just, like like I said, the, the, the billet family moved in with, it was how to acquire a free house. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm certainly not, I'm not a mathematician. Uh, I was always strong with numbers, but I mean, it's it's simple math, really. I'll, I'll give you an example. So for a property that we just did, it was a duplex in Peterborough. So acquired it for 270. Purchase price was 270. I think we put 80 into it. And then it appraised for by, uh, sorry, 450. So the bank was willing to give us up to 360, I want to say on that. Yeah, three. 60 on it. So basically at the end of the day, after you pay out your existing debts and whatever you paid to renovate the property, you end up with a, a property that has an infinite return because you really don't have anything left into that property. So it just gives you the, the ability to, to recycle money. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's basically a value. You need something that is, I think a lot of the time the, the good deals are bought on the purchase because even if you, you know, if you buy a, a house that's in a house at market value and it doesn't matter what finishes you put in it, if you want to put 
gold toilets or whatever, if you want to over renovate a property, you can do it very easily, but you might not get the appraisal on it. So yeah. you might not be able to pull out as much money as you thought you were going to. Yeah, for sure. For, for those, you know, wondering what to you does it mean to buy on, you know, that it, the property is made on the purchase? Like, what does that mean? to you for our listeners? Um, so it's definitely something that needs work. I mean, there's some common variables that a property that's under market value is typically in a property that area that is already like established and it's just a property that's in disrepair. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, the comparables that will be chosen to, to compare against your property once it's renovated are the ones that are within, you know, it might be depending on how specific that property is, but, you know, within a maybe like a, a mile radius or a kilometer radius. So yeah, you basically want to bring that property up to the standard of all all the other houses, but you, for every dollar you put in the house, you want to essentially make, you know, $3 or two to $3 on it. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so you've done a few of these now. What what are some of the uh, takeaways that you and your wife have, have sort of experiences or, or maybe even some of the mistakes you've made that then uh, lessons you've learned along the way? Uh, so yeah, that's the one thing in real estate and I'm sure you can, uh, you can agree with this, but there's, uh, there's, you're learning stuff constantly, right? Like it's mm -hmm. nothing ever goes according to plan the way it's drawn up. Everything has to be, you know, everything has to adapt. You have to be flexible. I mean, this last two projects we've done, that was right when uh, COVID happened when, when, I mean, it's, it happened right at the start when everyone, when there was a, a lot of panic ensuing. So that put huge strain on our timelines that we initially like drawn up, you know, the city wasn't inspecting contracts actors. These are people I work with a lot. So I also didn't want to put them in a situation where, you know, if they didn't feel comfortable being on site, I wasn't forcing that at all. So yeah. I, I, we basically things slowed down for a good, like two months, but that that's certainly, that's one thing that that is killer with these spur deals is the longer they take. I mean, it basically cuts into your profit margin, just like a flip would essentially. Mm -hmm. um, the, the one mistake, yeah, the one mistake that this was a huge eye opener for us. Um, we did a, we bird a, a fourplex and this is, is, this is at the time when I, I actually enjoy doing a lot of the work I do. And it's, it's been a huge mental hurdle for me to overcome, you know, just trying to do everything myself. Mm -hmm. But so this fourplex, you know, we were able to let out all, all our money out of it, but it took basically, it, it took over a year. It was like 14 months. And, you know, I've, I factored and what I thought I was saving in labor, you could really, you know, we could have had that project done in seven months realistically. Right. So it's like, at what point are you, you putting a value on? On your own time for sure a a not only are you paying more on holding costs but like how much rent was i losing over those additional you know five six months you know mm -hmm. now that property mm -hmm. pulls in i think our rent roll on that one's like 50 5100 a month uh, or something something similar to that but in gross so think about that over the course of five months you know, yeah. and then what I thought I was saving in in labor, like it's like okay, well, you actually didn't save anything, and and I'm I don't know if you've ever had a project that is gets drawn out that long, but it can get mm -hmm. to a point where you like you just start like not wanting to go to that project anymore. It's like this has just been dragging on. You lose that, you know, you lose that motivation. You just want to kind of have it done. I've been there. I uh, I, I'm I, I had a similar path because I I uh, flipped properties for a long time, but I did a lot of my own work. Uh, you know, HVAC and electrical and plumbing I would hire out, but I would do the majority majority of, of everything else. And uh, I've been there, you know, where you're you're at month eight, month 10, uh, maybe even a year. And it's just, man, I don't even want to go back there anymore. Um, totally. And so it's an it's definitely a lesson and experience where you just you realize the value of your time. You realize that there are uh, people that, you know, do this for a living. They can get these projects done uh, at an expedited process, and especially when you're burring. Uh, you know, the, the goal is to, to attempt to come in at essentially zero um, where you, like you said, get a property for free. And so if you can accomplish that and get it done in a much faster time. Timeline. Like you said, the rents will generally equal that out. Oh, absolutely. It's also, but you know what? It's also a catch 22 because, you know, had I not experienced that, that, that really, after that mind shift happened, it's like, okay, like what other areas of the business can I, can I, can I basically like outsource and system, systematize? So I like yeah. maintenance calls before, you know, I'd, I'd go to a house and try to fix something, you know, a couple of times it happened where I went there to try to fix it. Be like, you know what? Like this is over my head. So I've been here for two hours. Now I call a plumber. Now it's like, you know what? I'm not even going there. Like yeah. here's, here's, here's basically, we have a system 
system in place now for maintenance requests and stuff. So yeah, so it, it basically was a mind shift that had to, ha had to happen. But uh, yeah, like everything else, it's a learning experience, right? So uh, speak to that system. Are you still self-managing? And, and what, what kind of system have you and your wife put in place uh, for those maintenance requests on your properties? Yeah, yeah. So we do we do self manage. That's that's my wife. She she's she's very good at it. She deals with all basically leasing and, and all the admin side. So we have a system in place now where we have we have a team. Like I said at the, the start of this uh, podcast, where you know you have valuable members of your team and you treat them right. Like these are people that we we do business with constantly. And so we have uh, you know there's a couple maintenance people here that we have that uh, if something comes in, basically we'll just send them basic the, the maintenance request that comes in. We have a, a an email system specific for maintenance uh it comes in and then basically we'll just forward that to them um and then because we ensure that the 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 resident use their um they leave their phone number their unit number address that way our maintenance these are people that i trust and i, I know will do a good job and treat everyone with respect they'll call set up an appointment and then it'll get done so that's that's basically the back end awesome yeah. Awesome. So, uh, so what are some of the, you know, for people wondering, like, what are the big maintenance issues uh, that you guys have addressed and how do you attempt to mitigate those? <laughs> so that's, you know, that seems to be the topic of conversation. Anytime you, you, you tell someone about investment properties, everyone has this idea that you're slaving over these properties and, you know, that they're, they're eating up all your time. And then you get yeah. called at 2 AM. I don't even know the last time that's happened. Stuff comes mm -hmm. up, but it's like, whatever you just deal with it that's right. why you have these systems in place we we do like i guess the maintenance stuff that comes up regularly is you know if there's some plumbing stuff if there's something in the you know there's a backed up drain um you send a plumber in he augers it he, he sends you the invoice you send it back and that's that yeah. um you, you know it, it's it's not and there's you know our turnovers we do our turnovers you know very thoroughly like we have a system in place for finishes we use you know so we we, we basically when we go to show a property since since uh since covid happened we did a lot of virtual showings where we just basically did a video walk through very thoroughly and so that's what we send to prospective residents they go through it and the condition that it's in at during that video after it's all cleaned out and, and, and what it is is what they will get it in so we'll send mm -hmm. over a team to turn over and then that's and then we have a checklist after people move out that this is all the areas we're checking and then we're getting it back to the condition that you see it in the video awesome awesome so what does that what does that kind of look like what are you guys uh do, that checklist look like uh for you for the turnover so yeah, so we're definitely um, wall finishings on walls. You know, I the amount of times I've gone into properties where on turnover, you know, if there's a, a picture that was hung, they just throw a little bit of spackle, don't even sand it down, and then try to re-rent it. Like yeah, no, no, like make it feel like you know you put care into your properties. It, it mm -hmm. just shows respect for 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 your your residents that are going to be living there. You know, this is a mm -hmm. service based business, so you need to provide a good service. So yeah, we have checklists basically going down, looking at what walls need to be painted, uh, areas of the floor that need to be you know replaced checking all the screens checking the appliances um checking any of the light fixtures that need to be changed out just to ensure that everything looks good right yeah for sure and and that's something that we preach often one of the reasons why we're big proponents of house hacking model is that when you live in a properly generally speaking you take much better care of it and then you probably become a much better landlord uh you know from there on out because oftentimes uh, i'm an agent and so i help quite a few people buy properties and and almost every uh duplex uh, not everyone, but most of them in my market have a lot of deferred maintenance, a lot of landlords in the past that have neglected the properties and such. And what I've come to find is that uh, like when my wife and I move into properties, we renovate it to a certain level, we get a higher quality tenant because they see the care we take care, uh, we put it under. And then also the people that buy it in our market to do the same, they just have higher quality units for their tenants and their tenants appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, it's short sighted, you know, it, to skimp on you save a couple of bucks here or there. Like, it's either pay now or pay later in this game. You know, yeah. if you if you defer maintenance now, then in two years' time, like you're you're gonna end up spending twice as much doing it anyway. Because, like you said, the level of care that is reciprocated from residents moving into your units, it won't be there. Yeah. And yeah, I totally think that's an advantage. It's a huge advantage of doing any sort of house hacking. Um, a, you're living there, but B, it's also like you're learning how to run a business you're seeing money coming in money coming like going out you're seeing this based at the very like you know macro level but once you get other properties it's essentially the same right yeah just so, on a bigger scale so with these properties uh at, you talk you mentioned the first one how were you financing these initially before you pulled the money out on a burr 
So the that for the first three, I was just putting down, yeah, putting down twenty percent basically on the first three, and then after that, we were doing uh, private money, and then at the end of yeah, private money for the duration of basically for the buys, we would finance the renovations with the HELOCs from the existing properties, and then we would put a mortgage on those. Awesome. So, so yeah, and that's go, that's go, yeah. That's, sorry, go ahead. Go, go into private money a little bit. We 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 touch a little bit on it. Uh, my wife and I also have used private money. Talk a little bit about you know, approaching someone with that, kind of how you structure it, what that looks like. Obviously, everyone isn't going to have the same structure, but just uh, touch a little bit on how you structured your uh, private money loans. So, yeah. So the thing about private money is you, well, you need to have certainly, you need to establish a track record, right? You need to at least show projects that you've, you've, you've completed and the success that, you know, you've had in the past because success isn't, it leaves clues, right? So if you've done other projects before that are successful, like, you know, there's a good chance you're going to do it. Not guaranteed, but you're going to basically follow that same trajectory. Um, private money is just, so what we've done is uh, we've kept it with uh, friends and family and mm -hmm. basically we've guaranteed a return. So they're lending us money at a higher interest rate than they would otherwise be getting if they had, you know, something and that they were getting return like low interest wise. And yeah, so they're keeping the money in for whatever the term is. And at the end of that term, you're just like, a, it's just like a, just a mortgage, just like a private mortgage. Right. And then you're just, you're discharging that. And uh, yeah, but you just need to make sure that you have a, uh, an exit strategy. Yeah. Or else, because you're paying a higher interest rate than you would otherwise if you got a conventional loan. But I mean, if you buy right and the property works well, then you could also, if, if the person was interested, then you could do long-term financing on it. Just has the numbers have to work. For sure. And I love that you mentioned a track record because we get the question uh, asked often is that, you know, I'm going to wait until the market crashes and things like that. And, and there's no, there's nothing wrong with that. But the problem with it is that generally speaking, lending squeezes. So, so it's much more difficult to get uh, a loan. And then uh, on top of that, it's almost, uh, impossible to get private money if you don't have a track record. People aren't going to lend their hard-earned money during times of, of down cycles uh, to somebody without a track record. And I think that goes back to maybe our, you know, playing sports, you playing in professional hockey, that we were conditioned that you needed to build a track record behind you. And, you know, sometimes I think that's forgotten by new investors, you know, waiting for the next market crash is that if you don't get involved and build a track record behind you, it's very tough to attract money uh, in those down cycles. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, you hit the uh, the nail right on the head there. You know, just relating back to professional sports. I mean, you need to you need to prove yourself and you need to show that you know you're consistently this type of player. Just like in I mean, just like if someone's making an investment with you with a property in professional sports, like someone's making an investment with you as an athlete. So if you, you know, if you haven't played for a few years or like, you know, if you just decided to start hockey last year and you don't have a, you know, a proven track record of hey, you know, being a steady shutdown defenseman or being like, you know, a goal scoring left wing, like, you know, no one's going to be like, oh, we, you know, we want to make this investment in you. Like this is, you know, this is why we, you know, it's, it's not going to happen. And that just translates exactly to real estate as well. It's, it's, uh, you know, success leaves clues and you need to just like you or I, like if, if someone was brand new to real estate investing, I wouldn't be the first one to lend money to them, you know, but I wouldn't hesitate if they had a track record and if they've accomplished this numerous times. Times and they propose whatever they proposed to me made sense. The the deal that they put under contract makes sense. Yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't hesitate. I would help someone out as well. Yeah, for sure. Track record is so crucial. And that's why we're such big proponents of house hacking, because if you can start off in that realm, maybe fix up a property, dramatically lower your housing expense, or maybe even eliminate it. And but, but the biggest thing is just building that confidence and track record to be able to go long term when markets do decline, when the credit markets do squeeze and be able to access capital because you have a track record, you have people that believe in you, you have people that, ha you know, have saw, you know, looked at the result that that, you know, you, Mark, have, have made and, and others because now you have have that, you know, you have 13 properties, you bird many of them, they can go look at your physical properties, and you can tell them, hey, listen, this is why you should invest in me and vice versa. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I'm not going to pretend like there's there's people out there that, you know, are doing huge syndications and, and you know, they're, I, I don't, the private money I'm getting isn't from, you know, it's not from people that I, I don't know. You know, I've heard people say that, that, you know, this could also go backwards and it could go backwards, but you know, this is your, again, like, you know, it's service-based business. Like you're, if someone invests money in you, like the, the last thing that would ever cross my mind is not repaying them and repaying them on time. I would do whatever I had to do on my end. If I had to leave money 
money in in the deal if i had to go and you know work 23 hours a day to get this done by a timeline like i would do that because i you know i care about other people and i care about them taking a chance and helping me and my wife out and my 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 family and yeah yeah absolutely it's not even on my radar like you, you got to build that trust right that, that's a point to highlight because you know it just shows uh you have a you know a long-term horizon that you're looking at rather than maybe a short monetary gain because again you know trust can be easily evaporated. You know, if you if you don't return your money to your your partners, that word gets around, you build a reputation. And and again, it is so important to stress the fact that, you know, you have to just do what it takes. If you're going to take on somebody else's money, you have to you have to take that with the utmost responsibility and have a high level of character in making sure that money gets back to whoever you are taking that from. Absolutely. It's like, you know, trust and integrity. It's, 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 you know, it's hard to get, you have to prove yourself, right. But yeah. it's so easy to lose. Like, yeah, for sure. It, you know, so easy to use and, and to lose. And like you said, you know, this, everyone's, everyone talks, everyone's connected. So, you know, by you thinking short sighted and, and, you know, you know, taking an easy out or whatever like that, like it's naive to think that you can get away with this for, 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 you know, this, this will be essentially at some point, this will be the end. This is, you, you need to build that trust. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Do so you mention uh, speaking to some of your teammates and others in the league, um, sort of about the idea of, of, you know, renovating properties, house hacking and things like that. What, what were some of those conversations like and how receptive uh, were those that you were talking to them about? I have had this conversation. Honestly, I can't even, if if I got paid, you know, a dollar for every time that I had this conversation, I'd probably have a down payment by now. Yeah. Like it's, <laughs> honestly, like it's, yeah, like you get a lot, you spend a lot of time with people, all the guys I used to play with, basically you spend a lot of time with these people traveling and, and you know, everyone talks about housing and investments and blah, blah, blah. And this is, yeah, I've had this conversation so, so many many times and you know especially if it's a young guy that steps into you know a signing bonus again somebody makes that investment in you steps into a sign a signing bonus like they would rather and i saw it time and time again like they would rather go buy you know an escalade than they would you know even yeah. even look and i don't know if it's a it's a it's an ego thing but it's also just they don't have that knowledge you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and i i even talk to guys that work now like young guys that are looking to buy their first home i'm like listen i'm like you could say yourself up for the future here think about it like even if it it either i I try to tell everyone to buy a multifamily, and you know if it's if and if i could go back and and if it was me that was buying my first place i would buy the biggest one i could if i was a fourplex or i know a couple um banks loan on uh residential loans on a sixplex Mm. in 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 canada i would do that a hundred percent i mean yeah it's gonna be a steep learning curve but you're gonna learn it and you know you might have to go and and live in a unit that you otherwise wouldn't live in, but hey, like it's four walls and a roof, renovate it, like yeah. paint walls, put new flooring down, or pay someone to do it, and then learn how to run a business. You see cash flow coming in, you're living for free. When you move out, now you get market rent for a brand new apartment. All right. And then also, like, this is now you can leverage that asset. You can buy more. Like, it's, yeah, I, again, I've had this conversation so many times. And I, with the exception of maybe a couple people that I've interacted with, like, not too many people have pulled trigger. I think it's, I don't know. I don't know. What, I, it, it, it still boggles my mind. What is it that uh, maybe you see click with others and clicked with you? Because uh, we come across the same thing. So many people set out to to want to invest in real estate or, um, you know, house hack. But it, it seems like almost the 80-20 rule applies even to this, where, you know, we get bombarded with people that want to, but they don't, generally speaking, most don't actually pull the trigger. What is it do you think that clicks with someone to actually take that step? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I th- there's so much like w- conventional wis- wisdom, um, you know, unless you have someone, a mentor, or you had someone in your family that's investing in real estate, like, you really don't grasp it. Yeah. Even yeah. Na- even now, when I talk to someone that that doesn't have any experience, like their their mindset is basically like you you buy a house you know, you rent it for 25 years and when it's paid off, then that's when you can actually, you know, this is, I guess, a retirement thing for you, which is yeah. some people yeah. do, like some people do turnkey investing and that's fine, mm-hmm. but that's just, you know, that's, that's not what gives you the ability to, to scale. Right. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah, I think it's basically people struggle with, it's a, it's a, it is a short-term sacrifice, right? I mean, it really, it really is. Like yeah. it's a, you know, especially when you could go if you if you if you get a pre-approved, you know, you could go buy this single-family home, and uh, you know, it's it's a beautiful place. Or it's like, you know what? I'm gonna go buy a single-family home, and it's gonna need some work, and I'm gonna rent out the other four bedrooms, and then you know, essentially, I'm gonna live for free. 
And then I'm going to basically save the money that I otherwise would be spending on a mortgage and I'll put that on another property. Yeah. You know, as yeah, I'm sure you've had the same conversations. Like it's, uh, it's like, as soon as someone does realize the power of real estate, then they're like, their eyes are wide open. Right. But getting to that point is difficult. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's like, uh, you know, it almost goes beyond like delayed gratification. It's just that they want, it seems to me, uh, it's obviously so much easier to impress other people. If you buy a, a big traditional house or you buy the car, like you had mentioned, uh, with a lot of your teammate or whatever that status symbol is, it almost seems like, you know, it is, it, everyone knows what they should do or might, you know, what the wise thing to do would be. Uh, but it's tough to get over that hurdle of impressing other people. I, I feel like uh, is a lot of, because we're conditioned, you know, with HGTV and, and uh, you know, just, car commercials and, and all of that, um, we're, we're sort of conditioned to to want to buy things to impress others rather than do the uh, the thing that might set us up long term the best. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, that's you, 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 you look through Instagram, you turn on TV, like, you know, right away, it's everything, all the shiny things are right in your face. Yeah. So it's it is certainly, you know, it's the delayed gratification. And it's, 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 it's basically even when you could have those that brand new car, or whatever, you know, it's basically you get to a point though where you just change your lifestyle and then maybe you do pers- maybe that's your goal at the end of once you have enough you know cash flow coming in that you know maybe that ends up funding this car or whatnot or maybe you've just adapted your lifestyle now to a point where like hey like that's not necessarily important to me anymore mm-hmm. yeah. yeah no that's, that's important and i think this year more than many others because we've you know a lot of people have been locked down for a while and they've been able to evaluate their life and and uh in a way that probably they hadn't before that you know uh making sure that that, you know, that car that, that that takes up so much of their budget, is that actually producing, you know, maybe the uh, life uh, essence and energy that they were hoping for? Um, and, you know, maybe uh, at least from what we're seeing, there's a little bit of hope that people are reevaluating certain decisions that they've made in the past. And, uh, you know, so so on that note, you guys are up to 13 units. What are your sort of long-term goals uh, with this in, in real estate? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. My my wife and I have talked about that recently. I still, I still love my, my career and my mm-hmm. uh my, my wife's uh, a teacher um and i know she still loves her career as well um so we don't have like you know i don't think we have like a, a, a set goal where um you know we want to hit this many units by this date or have this much you know cash flow coming in but i think we just you know see the value in it you know it's mm-hmm. kind of like a five-year plan like this is we just want freedom you know basically yeah. the just the ability to not have to question finances it's like yeah. you know it's inevitable that things come up in life mm-hmm. and things are expensive and unfortunately like there's some you know there's some major whether it's uh, something health related or, or stuff affects your family it's like not even you know without even thinking twice about it it's like having that ability to like help those people or do you know what i mean like it's yeah for sure it's just having that uh that comfort i guess is Mm -hmm. is 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 a good way to put it and and knowing that you know you can take care of not only yourself and and do the things you want to do travel or or you know live where you want to live or or drive what you want to drive but it's the ability to like hey help others like without thinking twice about it and giving back for sure and my wife and i talk about that a lot you know, just what house hacking has allowed us to do mentally, you know, where a lot of times, especially during times like COVID, um, you know, people maybe aren't as willing to help others or do the things that actually bring them, you know, just a sense of, you know, helping others and, and that that good spirit that comes with it, you know, and where when you're when you're house hacking and, and you're in real estate and you you begin to kind of, you know, get closer and closer to financial freedom, the mindset and the relief you have uh, to be able to help others to to make more thoughtful decisions is just uh, overwhelming. You know, it, it exceeds what most people ever are able to uh, do and think and, and, and the decision making, you know, you're much more crisp with it. Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. You know, we're our, our our lives are you know bringing having the ability to, to to bring value to the lives of others, and you know leave something for your own family and and help your community or or help. I mean, just by you doing this uh, this podcast, I mean you're helping a lot of people here. Like having that ability and and having so you know you have the time to do this. You know, having that ability to help others and 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 see if you can share with them what you've learned, and you know whether that's helping a local charity or, or like I said before, if something comes up in in your family, whether it's the health reason or whatever, and having the ability to help them and not think twice about it. I mean, it's yeah, it, it's that clarity that you can make decisions. You can look at things pretty well, like objectively and not necessarily subjectively, because you have the means to back it up. For sure. 
So you you mentioned Rich Dad Poor Dad, which is a very very popular book, and and that was one of the books that set me on the right course as well. Is there another book or or podcast or maybe mentor or coach or something in your life that really helped you know you to to give you the mindset that you have today, the, the sustainable mindset to invest long term and and uh, not only just real estate mindset, but maybe just lifestyle mindset in general. Yeah, like I think relating again back to when I was sixteen and moved in with that family, you know, playing hockey. Like he's still my mentor. We like we talk all the time. He still do doing deals himself. We, we, yeah, like I said, like we've just developed a really, really strong friendship in terms of, yeah, podcast and reading. That's something I'm constantly doing, you know, as, as sexy as you can think real estate is looking at seeing, you know, 15 second clips of this and mm-hmm. that and HGTV, like, don't get me wrong. Like there's problems that arise. And if it's your business, like it's up to you to solve these problems. So yeah. there is, you know, there certainly is a lot of mindset that you have to, you have to overcome. And even though, you know, I read a book and it's like, you know, after you read it or during, you know, things feel good, things look clear, but like you need to maintain that. So I'm constantly, you know, learning and reading and listening to podcasts, this podcast, uh, you know, Bigger Pockets is something I listen to. Can't even count the amount of hours on bus rides and planes playing hockey yeah. that I would listen to Bigger Pod, Bigger Pockets, you know, audio books. Yeah, you name it. It's just constant learning. And I think that's, that's just part of growth with real estate. You know, they really draw parallels to each other. In terms of books, I, one that I really enjoy and it's one that I kind of reflect on and try to read maybe once a year or at least maybe not front to back but yeah. read a large portion is I like The Richest Man in Babylon. I, have you read that before? I have. I have. Yeah, it's an easy read but it's like it just it's like you know time tested sort of a model that it, it just works yeah. and it's it's very it's put in layman's terms. I know with some real estate books that I've read I lose interest because they're talking about all these crazy ways to analyze properties and and, you know, look at demographics and it's so basically, you know, it's, it's so dry. Yeah. Like this is layman's terms. Like I know what I'm reading. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think real estate, like the math's not that hard. Yeah. You can definitely overcomplicate it. And I think that probably scares a lot of people into taking action. Like I said before, you can get that, you know, paralysis by over analysis, but yeah. keep it simple. This is a, a simple book and it just kind of like puts your mindset right. And the same with Rich Dad Poor Dad. Like that's why people gravitate towards it because it's an easy read. Yeah, for sure. And I believe, Richest Man in Babylon was the very first book to ever sort of mention the idea of paying yourself first. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I believe I believe it was ten percent uh, is what he had, had recommended in that book. But sort of just the concept of before all else, making sure to pay yourself uh, first and saving that money um, to build wealth long term. Yeah, absolutely. And it's about basically like allowing uh, allowing your investments to basically fund your assets. Like it's, you know, they they use an analogy with with chariot chariots and gold coins and stuff, but I mean those what they talk about there is relevant to this day. Like it's the 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 concepts don't change. Yeah. No, for sure. Well, Mark, we really appreciate you coming on. Uh, for people that are interested in your story, I mean, you guys have an awesome Instagram where you where you kind of go through all of your deals and, and kind of show before and afters and a lot of the work that you're doing. Where can people find out more about you? So that's something that yeah, my wife's really been pushing kind of me to uh, to, to to do. But we've we've I guess we started that Instagram together. It's uh, um, Sweat Two, the number two equity. Uh, and yeah, basically it's just what we have going on. Yeah, yeah. If you want to connect with us, it's through that. Cool. Well, you're story is amazing. And, and uh, we really appreciate you coming on. I know a lot of people will uh, not only relate to a lot of things within here. I mean, it, it's cool to hear an inside story of somebody who played professional sports and kind of the mindset that is created in a culture like that, like you mentioned. Uh, and obviously you and your wife, I mean, fantastic people. You're in two noble professions and, and uh, building this together. It's it's great to see. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, man. It's certainly been a, a ride and, you know, we're, we're, we're looking forward to see where, you know, where this takes us. For sure. For sure. Well, again, we encourage everyone to uh, connect with you guys there just follow along in your story. And uh, again, Mark, we really appreciate you coming on and sharing it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And just, just, just so I can tell, you know, your listeners, you know, the fact they're listening to this podcast is, is great and, and continue to, to educate yourself, but like, you know, take action. That's, that's the biggest thing. And it's always, it's always scary. And, and you can, you know, that if you ask enough questions, you'll find the answer and, you know, put your ego at the door, whether it's talking to contractors, building department, whatever it is, you might feel like you're a fish out of water, but ask questions. And at some point you'll, you know, you'll become 
comfortable being uncomfortable. For sure. And I think, you know, to that point of, of taking action, you know, you you being kind of, ha- you know, being willing to get involved at every step of the point, step of the way, you know, of course, now you hire a lot of those things out, but just being willing to, you know, be involved and just figure out the unknown is probably what helped you take action. Would you would you say that's probably correct? Oh, yeah. It's yeah. Every, I mean, you're in the business of solving problems. If that's if you want to get into real estate, that's what you're taking on. You want to yeah. solve problems. So you can't be scared to, to get down and dirty and, you know, whatever you have to do to, to accomplish the project you have to do. And it's going to take, yeah, it's going to take some, some, some blood, sweat and tears, but uh, yeah, it's worth it for sure. For sure. Well, uh, on that note, taking action, Mark, we really appreciate you coming on. And, and again, we hope we can uh, grow this community together and stay in contact. And uh, we really appreciate your story. Yeah. Thanks Bradley. I appreciate uh, your time. All right, man. Have a good one. Yeah, you too.